Hello, and welcome to Clearer Thinking with Spencer Greenberg, the podcast about ideas that matter. I'm Josh Castle, the producer of the podcast, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. In this episode, Spencer speaks with Svi Mauschewitz about taking action versus telling stories, simulacra levels, and moral mazes. Zvi, welcome. Thanks. Good to be here. I think of you as one of the most classic rationalist thinkers out there. And I find that your work tends to get most cited by other thinkers. You're kind of a thinker's thinker, which I find really interesting. And I'm excited to explore some of the topics that you brought for us today. Let's start with this idea that people don't do things. What does that mean? So there's a lot of different aspects to it. In general, you know, you come to a person and you will doubtless recognize many ways in which they could make their life better. But they mostly just keep doing the things they're generally doing. They don't change. They don't innovate. They don't explore. Even when there's like clearly very powerful, valuable, low-hanging fruit for them to capture. If, if this was going to work, someone would have tried it already. If there was a story here, somebody would have found it and exposed it already. If this big company had this giant opportunity to make money by just fixing its obviously inadequate product so that it didn't have these off-putting errors in it or drive people away, they obviously would have figured this out. And this is kind of a similar to the efficient market hypothesis, where you presume that, of course, someone would have fixed all the prices, so you can't really do better. And what I've discovered is these things just aren't true, right? If you ask somebody if they've done the most obvious things they should do, sometimes they'll give you good reasons why they haven't done them. Sometimes they'll say they have done them, but very often they'll be, no, we haven't. If you have an idea that seems like it's the first thing you would try, decent chance nobody has tried it. And there's just remarkably low-hanging fruit pretty much everywhere all the time. And I've just gotten used to this as the way things are and learned to always, always check the obvious stuff. And to ask yourself also, are you doing the obvious stuff? Yeah, you know, myself. Often the answer is no, right? It's very easy to fall into this. Just, uh, that would require doing something. That would require me to like exercise thought and get up and think and figure out what makes sense and then deal with all of these little details and we should beware trivial inconveniences because they just, uh, I don't want to deal with that and it just drives people away. I think it's interesting to separate this out for personal things, like if you're talking to a friend who's dealing with a difficult situation versus societal things. Because on the personal level, you could imagine, well, people have limited energy, they have limited brainstorming that they do, et cetera. And so it's like, it seems very easy to see how someone could just miss really obvious things. Whereas if you look at a societal level, maybe it's like more strange and surprising in a way, if this is true, because it's sort of like, well, aren't there lots of people trying lots of things and lots of people looking for opportunities and so on? So I'm wondering, do you think that this is sort of driven by different factors when we're looking at the individual versus the societal? I think there's a lot of overlap and also a lot of different stuff. I mean, for the societal, a lot of it is that people's actions are very highly correlated at this point, right? Everybody is kind of going through the same considerations. Everybody has the same or similar pressures on them in many ways. Everyone is listening to the same opinions. Everyone is worried how the same people will think of them in some sense. And so like people are just looking around and also as there are more people around to copy. There's more things to copy. There's more people who feel like they've already done the preliminary stuff. Everyone just thinks, well, it'd just be easier if I just did the thing everyone else is doing and I didn't try to innovate and I should be modest and I shouldn't believe that I know better than everybody else. And so it's, it's kind of a bystander effect, right? You have a thousand, 10,000, a million people, but you don't necessarily get more people doing something different than you would have if you had less people. Right, so if everyone was acting completely independently, you might have billions of opportunities for a thing to happen, right? But if people are substantially copying each other or just think really similarly or are convinced of a similar set of beliefs that are kind of limiting their behavior, then it might be in practice way, way, way fewer kind of independent attempts to try anything new. Is that the idea? Yeah, I feel like there's not very many actually independent effects to actually do the thing. I also feel like we've gotten away from doing the thing and towards symbol doing the symbolic representation of the thing, right? That was the first blog post when I started my blog over again and, and started devoting it to rationality instead of the stuff I was talking about before is, are you trying to actually accomplish something with your actions or are you trying to tell a story to yourself or to others 
to represent that you should be credited with attempts to do the thing. Because these are completely different actions with completely different motivations, completely different instantiations, and very different results. So kind of the symbol versus the thing itself. Do you have a, maybe a couple examples where people claim to be doing the thing itself, but really they're doing the symbol of the thing? The original motivating example came from the world of venture capital and startups. So the idea was, are you building a company or are you trying to be able to represent to a potential investor in your company in the next round that you are building a company? Are you selling the company or are you representing your attempt to represent that you can sell your company in the next round and other things like this? That reminds me of a conversation I had with a venture capitalist where they were telling me that they would only ever invest in a startup founder if their startup idea was kind of the culmination of everything they'd done before. So this person was on this path and this was just that next step on the path. And I thought about this for a moment and then I said to the VC, you know, I don't know if I know almost anyone who where their life works that way. Like, it seems like almost everyone, their life is kind of this nonlinear. They're like bumping into random things. They're not just like everything immediately follows as a consequence of what you've done before. And the VC thought about that for a moment. And then they said, well, I suppose you're right. I suppose it doesn't really work that way, but I still would never invest in them if they didn't tell me it was like that. Exactly. I can tell a story if I want to, where... All of the very, very jobs that I've had and things that I've explored have led me to this moment in my intellectual life and to my job as a writer. And that story will have some elements of truth in it, but mostly it'll be a made up story. But if what you're actually testing the founder for is their ability to be able to construct and sell the right story in a room because you're testing them for the Series A round so that what matters most is their ability to raise money in a Series B round and then a Series C round, if you are effectively betting on the salesmanship of the founding team above all else, then you can very reasonably use this strategy highly profitably, even though in the object level, it's it's obviously nonsense. Yeah, there's this interesting circularity where like the early stage investors are like, well, is this person going to be able to convince the next stage, right? And it's like, okay, but that's just everyone trying to predict what other people are going to be convinced by rather than looking at the thing itself. Now, obviously, we there are also investors who really are motivated by like looking at metrics, like trying to see how the thing is actually doing, trying to see the actual quality of the product, but that's sort of a different access of evaluating something. Right, and at the same time, right, like they all talk about things like the hockey stick graph and showing user growth and all of that. And, you know, Paul Graham will constantly talk about, you know, build something users want, build something that produces value. They try to pretend they are part of the same ethos and the same principle, but they're actually very distinct ways of trying to convince someone to invest in your company and two very distinct ways of trying to build a company. And when I was trying to do my own startup MetaMed, there was very much this clash of, should we try to run a business, like it was a real business, and try to do the concrete thing, or should we build the representation that shows people what the business could be in the future, right? Should we do the thing or the symbolic representation of the thing? And we learned too late, we should have been doing largely the symbolic version of the thing, and it was, definitely impossible for us to pivot. If you're constructing one of these hockey stick graphs, right, you're very consciously trying to construct this hockey stick graph. And that's a very different phase. And I think you definitely have to first do the thing where you're actually building a useful product, but then you have to transition to the hockey stick graph in some sense at some point, if you want to succeed. So you're saying that you were focused too much on doing the thing itself rather than the symbol of the thing. What's an example that kind of came up in your work where you were trying to do the thing rather than representing the thing? Well, For one thing, we were trying to charge money. We were trying to actually pay the bills, which then caused investors to have the wrong focus and look at us as a different stage of company and a different type of situation. Whereas if we had given the product away for free so that we could show that we were getting more users and get more reports, we almost certainly would have made that money back 10, 100 times over instead. But more to the point, we were very much like trying to dive into the literature, the medical literature, because that was what the company was about very carefully to try and figure out how to help the patients and figure out what exactly would help the patients as opposed to trying to give the patients like a positive vibe and experience and have them feel like they had had someone listen to them and care about them and it generated value. And so we paid too little attention to the symbolic composition of the thing and too much attention to what was actually going to help in the end. But if you don't pay enough attention to the symbolic thing, not only do they not appreciate what you're doing, they don't do the thing that would matter. 
And so, so what if you told them what would help if they don't get, if they don't do it, right? Like it's an intellectual exercise in your head that didn't help anyone. So in some sense, like you have to do both. If you don't take care of the symbolic portions of what you're doing, that legitimately doesn't work. But you still have to notice like which of these things is different. Yeah, it's so interesting in the realm of kind of, let's say, health advice, you have so many different advisors that are just advising nonsense, but can get really, really, really popular, right? And then you have people that are like advising legitimate stuff that may become much less popular or not popular at all. And so it's like, it seems like that's a domain in particular where actually tracking real substance seems less important. Well, Robin Hansen talks about this question of like, is medical care about showing that we care about each other and that we're willing to spend time and money and effort and, and emotion on each other and a judgment of who deserves what? Or is it an attempt to make people's health better? And how much of it is one versus how much of the other? And you, you have these studies that show that when you give people more health insurance and more health care on the margin, they don't live longer. They don't actually enjoy better health. Their life does not substantially improve. And so one could conclude that the majority of American healthcare spending is largely symbolic, right? That there's a very important core of things like vaccines and trauma care and like fixing your broken bones and antibiotics and a bunch of other stuff that's like clearly very, very important and positive and healthcare is really important. And if you don't have access to that, it's really bad for you. But that most of our money ends up being spent on things that have very little incremental value and that we often miss some of the most important opportunities to help people actually get better, right? We don't focus on their diets as much and their exercise as much as we should compared to direct medical interventions. We spend most of our money right at the end of life when there's a very clear symbolic story that this person has to be treated or they will die, when it's actually not so valuable to them. When people go to the hospital, we don't let them sleep. We don't let them eat well. We don't make them comfortable. When we know these things interfere with their recoveries, you know, and so on and so on. Right. The studies that you're talking about, I think I know what you're what you're referencing. And I think what they did is they gave people cheaper health care in a way that caused them to use more health care. And they found that those people who had cheaper health care and therefore use more didn't get better outcomes, which suggests, I mean, you use the word marginal. It suggests that on the margin, the health care wasn't helping them, but doesn't really necessarily say that most of the health care was useless. Just that like at the point where you're already consuming sort of the natural amount you would, adding additional stuff may not help very much. I don't know to what extent that affects your point. I mean, the, the central one was an Oregon study where they did a lottery to see who would get subsidized insurance where they would have much better access to health care and found that this was not a substantial improvement in people's health outcomes. So, yeah, it's a, it's a question of, again, if you have no access to a medical system whatsoever, you're thrown back into the 17 or 1800s or something, you will obviously fare much, much worse. The most important health care spending is very important. And then the there is the other question of, are they making a good job of consuming the important spending and not the unimportant spending when they are in the less access condition, right? Is our society doing a good job of getting them what they really need? And that's hard to say, but my experience of healthcare has indeed been that a lot of what is on everybody's mind, despite the stakes being someone's health and whether or not they will live, are the symbolic aspects of the question. And it goes back to this, you know, this whole dynamic once again. There's a concept that I think about that, that I call hype versus value. And I, I wonder if it's, it's just the same thing you're talking about or if it's just very related. So, so I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. But the basic idea, I use the phrase value to refer to anything that produces intrinsic values for people. So things that meet people's fundamental needs or make people happy or give people, help people achieve their like meaningful goals, that kind of thing. And, you know, obviously some products help with that, some services help with that. Um, and then I think of hype as anything that's about getting people excited or enthusiastic or getting them social status for doing a thing. Not to say that, you know, getting social status couldn't be someone's intrinsic value, but I just think it's useful to separate those out. And so then I can think about these like this two axis system. Let's say you've got on the X axis, you've got value on the Y axis, you've got hype. And then you can start placing things in this kind of chart, right, of like how much hype is there and how much value. And I think on something like, let's say, art NFTs, like I would put that almost entirely in hype with very little value 
or you could have something like, I don't know, Tesla's, right? So Tesla's clearly, cars clearly have a lot of hype, but you know, you arguably they, you know, some people would argue they could produce a lot of value too. And maybe, maybe they could help with climate change. People really enjoy using the cars, like they're very highly rated and people enjoy the experience of riding them and so on. So yeah, I'm just curious to hear like how that kind of maps onto what you're talking about. So when I hear that description, I wonder about the, the distinction between sort of just positional goods, right? Where something legitimately is helping you gain status and relative positioning in some sense. And then what is closer to the conventional use of the word hype, where it's all talk and bluster and you're getting people excited and you're trying to find a greater fool or trying to pretend that you're getting value out of something, but you're not actually fulfilling anybody's needs at all. Whereas, you know, status and positional goods, they're a legitimate human need in some sense, right? We all greatly value this. And so they result in very different orientations. Like, I don't think it's entirely symbolic to provide someone with important positional goods. Whereas when you've got, you know, this, you know, art, this NFT that's like highly speculative, doesn't actually have any utility, doesn't go anywhere. And I say this as somebody who made an NFT game at one point when we were trying to abuse them with utility, that the default case is completely useless. They don't even function as proper positional goods. And... So yeah, I don't even know what that's trying to do, what that's trying to be, but there's some sort of hype thing going on there. I think that's a fair point that those two things, like positional goods, could be separated out from other forms of hype. I link them together but because I think a lot of times when something is sort of like hyped in the classical sense, there's also a sense of it like being cool to be part of or cool to invest in or, you know, it, there's a sort of a, a social status element to it. I also think that with, with positional goods where people are just like raising and lowering their social status, there tends to be no net value added to society most of the time. Like, you know, maybe one person gets cool or another person gets less cool or something like that. But that like, so some people are maybe meeting their values more, but like on net, maybe there's not an improvement. Yeah, I think the reason why positional goods are valuable is not because, you know, the amount of the good necessarily went up, but because the act of trying to produce the good, if it's actually in some sense a real good, will often like cause us to improve our productive capabilities for competition, for activity in, in useful ways. But yeah, it, it's very distinct from things that are fulfilling non-positional goods, just pure good goods, right? We, we want a society that focuses as much as possible on producing the things that are not positional. So going back to this question of whether there's sort of low-hanging fruit all around, right, that the, that the world is just sort of highly unoptimized, I think that when I was younger, I would definitely have agreed with that, where you know, I was just seeing all these ways that things were suboptimal. And as I have like, had more experience in the world, I continue to think that that's true, but I think my perspective on that has changed somewhat, where I now think that a lot of the ways it's unoptimized, it's actually really, really hard to fix. So it's like vastly easier to notice, ah, this thing is like not optimized in this way, but but like dramatically harder to actually like make that change. And so often that change like, it's so hard that like it kind of starts to make sense why nobody has made it yet. And so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. I think that is indeed one of the major ways in which people learn, in some sense, not to try doing things. They find some of these very obviously great things that nobody is doing, and they find out why trying to do that naively just doesn't work. There are all these doors, and these doors look like they are opening to rooms of treasure, and they look like they're unguarded and you try to open them, and you find out why you're wrong about some of them. And then you say, oh, I guess when I see something that's an opportunity, there's some stupid reason why it isn't. The world just works that way, and people just sort of slink off, and they stop trying. I think this is a pretty common phenomenon. But often the answer to why they don't do it is something like mild social awkwardness, or it would be somewhat unpleasant or inconvenient to find out rather than, no, someone will actually stop you. There's actually some stupid regulation about this, or there's some actual opposition somewhere. Yeah, I guess I would say it's genuinely a mix. Like, I think probably more often than not, when you see something that's an obvious kind of poorly optimized feature of the world or something that clearly business could do better and so on, that there are hidden reasons why it's not being done. And it doesn't mean they're good reasons. Hidden reasons are very different than good reasons. Like it could be really dumb, but it still could be really hard to change. But sometimes it's like actually can just be changed. Maybe in order to change it, it requires like a really good strategy. So I guess I guess that's what I think is true, is that it's not that they're unchangeable. It's that they're usually hard to change and it requires like a really good strategy. 
and like really engaging very closely with the details of why it hasn't already been done, like the details of the structure around what makes it hard to change, and then like pushing in just the right angle with with the right amount of force to get that to change. Or yeah, finding out exactly where you want to push on it. Or alternatively, there's this phenomenon where as you get older and wiser, you start to internalize all of the pressures and culture, cultural norms and tendencies and reasons why these things don't get fixed. So like I, at one point, you know, came into this company and was given reasonably good pay and broad authority and some equity and, you know, told go out there and make us succeed basically by the, one of the, by the owners. And I went in like a cowboy and I started just putting my hand in everything and fixing everything and improving everything. And every time a number was different than what it should be, I was like, that's the wrong number. And I told the person involved in it why I was changing the number or why it needed to change. And I would argue about everything. And this was very effective. But then over time, I found out why this did not in fact lead to me accomplishing my personal goals at this company. And I think if I had to do it over again, I would probably end up making them a lot less money than I did. So you're saying essentially you bumped against like political issues where it actually turned out to not be in your own interest to make these changes? Yeah, it turned out I was I, I was doing things that were like either I wouldn't get any credit for it or I would piss somebody off or I would be seen as pushy or as like going outside the chain of command or exceeding my authority or I, you know, I wasn't considering all the angles and I was too naive and dumb to realize I couldn't do the thing. So I just did it. Right. There's, there's a longstanding standing saying the person who says it can't be done should not interrupt the person doing it, especially when they have a good reason in many cases, I think. And so we learn why we shouldn't be doing these things, why the incentives work against being the person who fixes the problem. And then nobody fixes the problem when we'd be much better off if every time there was a problem, somebody just fixed the problem, whether or not they would get rewarded for it. And then everyone would have a lot less problems. Right. And that I think is a great example and sort of highlights what I think is often happens with this low hang, seeming low hanging fruit, that there's something hidden like that. Again, it doesn't mean it's not worth fixing. It doesn't mean it can't be fixed. It just might mean that it's like you have to navigate a bunch of traps that you didn't see at first, right? Or you need coordination and, and helpfulness and you need to be able to, in some sense, care enough about it to take one for the team and pass up better opportunities and better trade offs from your perspective elsewhere in order to do it or it's not gonna work. And I think when we often say it can't be done, right? We don't mean it can't be done. We mean here are all of the different barriers in place or the reasons why it's not going to get done. Often it's something like, well, technically this person is in charge of it and this person is hard to work with and annoying or has this consideration or all these other reasons why this is going to be more frustrating than it should be or harder than it should be, or why nobody's going to have the individual motivation to do it. Somebody really, really cared about this being wrong, or someone really, really cares about not being bothered to fix anything, or just about nothing changing. And how you look at that is up to you, in a real sense. One of the examples that I think about, because it's something that I work on, is the replication crisis. You know, we have lots of different social science results not replicating, and thinking about, well, there are certain actors that could take steps that would make it dramatically better, right? Like if journals just required all papers must release their data, right? No exceptions. Uh, you know, and okay, sure, if you have really sensitive data, you can maybe have parts of it that you, that you don't release, right? Fine. But other than that, you know, it's got to be released. If you had them do, if the journals did random spot checks where they, you know, so be, in addition to review, like one out of every 10 times, they would actually try to reproduce the results and like check the data carefully and so on. Like, you, you know, there's just a bunch, there really are a bunch of things that could just be done. But then if you actually think about like who's in the, who has the power to do that? And it's like, how does that benefit? Them? How does that help them achieve their goal? Right. If you're one of the top journals and you're making money by publishing flashy results, if anything, this actually may, maybe makes the results less flashy and less interesting. It's just not clear, you know, maybe at some point the tide will turn where it's like there's such a credibility hit that like it actually is in their interest to to clean things up. But until that point, you know, maybe that maybe their interest is almost the opposite. I think it's very clear that their interests are the opposite and that these journals are in a position where they're extracting a lot of rent and they are benefiting a lot from the current system. 
and they're not going to voluntarily change it. And I, I've been exploring my frustrations as well with the other side of that coin, which is the file drawer effect, where I want to study, get groups together to study problems in AI like interpretability, where I've been warned, oh, if you work on interpretability and you don't have the help of the people who've been there for years, then you'll just keep trying all of the ideas that we already, we already know don't work. And then the obvious response is, well, then where are the thousand papers explaining all these techniques that don't work and why they're never going to work? Okay, maybe not papers, but how about blog posts? And of course, the answer is it's, it's not particularly the urgent theming thing to do to publish why here are a hundred ways not to figure out what's going on inside that inscrutable matrix. But it would be really important if somebody did it. Yeah, it's a really interesting example. And, and yeah, you just get so much less credit for saying, I tried this thing. It didn't work. Here's what I did. Like, just you, you just don't get rewarded as an academic. Whereas if you find something cool, well, now you get a nice paper, you get something nice on your CV and so on. Yeah. And then it comes back to this idea of if you propose doing things a different way, then people will look at you like you're weird, like you're doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. And this kind of awkwardness and doubt is enough to drive away, in my experience, people who, when you talk to them intellectually, will fully understand, no, the current system is broken, the incentives are broken, people are not going to do the things that you want them to do. You have to take them outside that system and just do the thing. But you have the power to do the thing. And yet we have all of these people in our society who have the affordance to help do that, especially the, the billionaires of us. And those people feel too socially constrained to act in the ways that will fix these types of problems. They feel the need to channel their resources through these institutions that preserve all of these problems. Have you ever wondered if you have what it takes to be the founder or CEO of a successful startup? It takes a wide range of skills to run a successful business. Fortunately, Clearer Thinking has developed a quiz to help you determine if you have what it takes to start your own company. They've assembled the wisdom of some of the world's most experienced entrepreneurs and venture capitalists, gurus who have started multiple companies themselves or advised hundreds of companies. And that compiled wisdom includes information about the most important traits and skills that must be embodied in top entrepreneurs to achieve startup success. They then boiled all of that down into a simple quiz that you can take for free. Take the quiz to find out how well your personality and skills are suited to founding a startup, how much you know about starting a successful company, which famous startup CEO you're most like, what your greatest strengths and weaknesses are, what to look for in a co-founder, and what areas you could work on to improve your chance of success. To find the Entrepreneur Test, along with many other tools and mini courses, go to clearerthinking.org. It's really fascinating the extent to which social information puts a constraint on people where there are many people that just feel like they're almost like incapable of doing something that might be judged or thought of, even thought of as weird in some cases. They're like one of the most striking examples of this. These, I believe it was South Korean co-pilots that would be realizing that their plane was going to crash, but were so reluctant to like question the pilot that they would just say these like really meek things like, we're low on fuel, like really calmly. And then like the, everyone would die. <laughs> and, uh, and you're like, well, wait a minute. Like in that, at that level of danger, like, shouldn't you be willing to just say, like grab the pilot and shake them and say, we're like, we were going to crash. But no, you, you know, even, even at that level of danger, like the, the, like the level of like social conditioning was so strong. You would think so. I mean, the last company I was working for, which I, I founded an iteration for, but by the end of it, I was not in a position of direct authority. I was not a founder anymore, effectively. I was not CEO or anything. And it was pretty obvious for months that what we were doing wasn't working and that our company was likely going to fail. And a lot of people clearly understood this, as I think is most of the time true in these situations. And like most of these situations, everybody just kept quiet about it. Right, they sort of slowly indicated more and more that they understood that things were not going well and that something had to change, but they weren't willing to raise their voice. Obviously, it's much more extreme when you are literally going to crash and likely everybody is going to die. And I would like to think that I would be able to overcome my reluctance in that situation and that most people would. But we now know that a lot of people don't. And I think you see this a lot. You, you see these very large problems 
that slowly get worse and worse. And, you know, people are like, well, in the moment, it would be more socially comfortable not to say anything. And so nobody says anything. And we wait until somehow it slowly morphs into a place where you can actually talk about it, unless you have a culture that's specifically designed not to do that. And clearly these pilots didn't. I've also seen this occur just anecdotally in my own life, where people go to a doctor about some really serious issue. The doctor says something that confuses them or clearly misunderstands it, what's going on. And then they're like, oh, I guess everything's fine. And I'm, I'm like, uh, okay, but did you ask the doctor this? And they're like, no, but the doctor said it was okay. And you're just like, wait, this is your life. Like, this is your life. You could die from this thing. Like, you need to ask the questions. You need to push the doctor. You need to just not just like be like, oh, well, the doctor, you know, seemed not that concerned, so I shouldn't worry about it. You know, so just like, yeah, it's there's this the weird way where I think especially around authority figures, some people can really struggle to do anything other than just do what the authority figure tells them. And they often know that. And for a related set of social reasons, will often just literally not tell anyone about their problem or refuse to go to the doctor. And I noticed this about myself that like, I don't want to talk to doctors about my medical issues and concerns because then they will start being doctors and using their level of authority to try and get me to do things. And I know that my preferences and models of the world about what I should be doing are different from theirs. But once they say that, then I have to be in a social world where I've been told that and I have a wife and it's hard not to tell her things. And then one thing leads to another and suddenly my life is so much worse. And even if I don't take these suggestions I don't want to take, then I've gone through all of the stress. And you know what? Things aren't so bad. I'm fine. Let's not worry about it. There's this quote that this makes me think of, which is something along the lines of, I wonder to myself, why doesn't someone do something? And then I realized I'm someone. And I think it's a really powerful idea of like realizing that you can just do things differently than other people, but it's scary and it's awkward and it's, you're going to second guess yourself, but at least it's possible. We've been evolved to very much fear the negative outlier, right? Like the tiger can kill you. The tiger can't make you super awesome and give you 10,000 grandkids. It can only kill you or not kill you. So if you're trying something weird, like maybe I get exiled. Maybe everybody suddenly hates me. Maybe something goes horribly wrong that I'm not thinking about. I can have model error in a number of places. Ugh, may better stick to the rivers and roads that I'm used to and just not worry about it. So there's a huge bias against stepping out in these ways until you've seen the examples, until someone else has tried or you've gotten comfortable with something similar. And when I end up doing things that look very different from what other people are doing, very often it's because I creeped towards them very slowly. Right? I tried something a little different and that seemed to go okay. And then I went to something a little more different and I tried something a little more different. And then suddenly, oh, I can just do this stuff. And now it looks like it's very, very different. I'm doing something very bold, but it never looked that bold to me. Yeah. And I think it's worth acknowledging there is a lot of sort of hidden wisdom in standard paths, right? Like if you do something that's like off the beaten path, there's a good chance that it's not going to work, right? Whereas the standard path, like it has something going for it. Lots of people have trodden it before, right? There's a, there's a sort of, uh, you know, inbuilt wisdom to that. 100% most people should be doing the standard thing most of the time. That's just true. And for depending on your definition of most, I mean, I do the standard thing, at least as I understand the standard thing for me, or even the standard thing in general, most of the time. You know, even the very weirdest people in the world, if you look at their actions minute to minute, second to second, step by step, 99% of the time, they're doing exactly what everyone else would do in that situation. It also makes me think about how different people play different roles societally. Like there's an ecological niche in society for people to try weird new things that probably won't work out and maybe will even be bad, but might also eventually become something that's really good and eventually lots of people will follow them and be able to do it too because they've sort of opened that doorway. Whereas also it's valuable to have lots of people doing standard things in a way that's just, you know, somewhat beneficial for society kind of executing on the, the known paths that produce some value. Yeah, if you have everybody constantly trying new things, that's not very efficient. That's not a good idea. You need a small number of explorers and a vastly larger number of exploiters. Right, exploiters in the in the technical sense of like, doing what's known to work, not in the exploiting people. I, I hate that that's call, called explore, exploit, because it's just so confusing. I hate they took our word. Like exploit used to just mean extract the value, you know, take advantage, extract the value from in a, in a positive way. 
or in a strategic way or any number of things. And now it's become this other thing. And that's fine. But in the context of the word explore, I think it's very clear and I'm not worried. <laughs> so what are simulacra levels or simulacra? I don't even know how to pronounce it. So this is a model that originally started as continental philosophy, but a bunch of people in the rationalist sphere, including Ben Hoffman and Jessica Taylor, and then I picked up the mantle, decided that we could make it our own and understand it better and reformulate. This idea is that there are levels of representation of how you use language and thought to relate to the world and to how we relate to each other. And if you're operating on different levels, you have different considerations and different things that you notice and care about. And it's important not to confuse them with each other and to understand at what level a statement or a person is operating on. And this will give you a lot of insight into that person or statement or dynamic or situation or culture. So the idea is level one is just the basic words have meaning. I am describing the physical world. I am saying things because I believe them to be true, and it would be good if other people knew things that were true. So at level one, I say, there is a lion across the river. And I mean, literally, there's a lion across the river, a thing that like has sharp teeth that might eat you across the river. And maybe we shouldn't go across the river because there's a lion there. Or maybe we should go hunt that lion if we want to hunt a lion right now. But that's the consideration. And then level two, is, well, other people are treating things as level one, so now I can be level two. So the idea is, I want you to believe that there is a line across the river, right? So level one is the truth, and then level two isn't exactly lying. It's, I am trying to get you to believe something about the world, right? I tell you there's a line across the river because I want you to think there's a line across the river. And that can be valid if there is one or if there isn't one. But it's a very different mode of thinking. I care about what's in your head and I want to change what's in your head because that will cause you to take different actions, which will be beneficial in some way to me. Then at level three, actions represent something, a statement about the person making them and their relation to other people who make other statements. It's a statement of loyalty, right? It means that I am one of the, I am in the faction of people who believe there's a line across the river or who don't want to cross the river because, you know, they talk about the lion. So when you're engaging in like coalitional politics, right, you're operating on level three and you're making statements that you don't really care if the statement is literally true. Like if it makes a physical true statement about the world, it's irrelevant to you what the level one operation is often, so, except insofar as that will cause people to go, what? Uh, in, in too much of an extent. What you're doing is you're signaling loyalty to this group. You're signaling membership of this faction. And you're using this in various ways to coordinate and figure things out. And sometimes the things that you say are things that you, on some level, know are not true. And that is not what you care about right now. And then in level four, you are treating words as they've completely lost their anchorage to the physical meaning. You actually lose the ability to like think logically about things or rationally at all to a large extent. Instead, you are thinking about like what associations and vibes things have, how different words will act upon different groups to cause them to be associated with different things in different ways. Originally, a lot of people try to think of four being the equivalent of two as it relates to one, except that four is relating to three. But I think there's something much more toxic and subtle about it. It's a way of operating in the world where words are very vibey and people are going to like form kind of networks in their heads and like you don't think in terms of plans and concrete actions and consequences. You think more and much more about associations. Like one way to think about that is that like large language models are often very much operating in the level four type of space. And that is like the motivation behind a lot of the things that sound very nonsensy, but also how they pick up on a lot of things that it's kind of amazing that they pick up upon. So just to recap here, so these are all about sort of the mind state of the person communicating, right? The mind state of the person communicating and in what way they hope to impact the world by saying the words, right? Like what they think is going on. Right. So like if, I, right. if I'm talking to you, I can be talking to you on any combination of these four levels. And the best communicators are thinking about the impact of their words on all four levels at once, right? If you have like a Jesus, 
they're thinking about like what the words mean on every level and checking to see what the impact will be and, and understanding all of that. Got it. So, so level one is there's literally a lion across the, the river. Level two is I want you to believe there's a lion across the river. Level three is I want you to believe I'm the sort of person that thinks there's a lion across the river. And level four is like, I want to give you the general vibe that the statement there's a lion across the river gives. Statements that lions are across the river did well in our focus groups. <laughs> That's at level four. <laughs> yeah, also another way of looking at like the kind of level four, but like level four is much, much harder to initially grok. And like simple statements tend to over sort of, sort of round it down. This thing where like they, they think it's something that's like much more sane and logical and grounded than it is, right? Like as opposed to this associational vibey thing. Why do you think these simulator levels are important to understand? Like what, what do you get out of this? I think it's important to understand because I am somebody who tries to operate as often as possible, right, on level one. I want to think about, okay, words have meaning. My statements are literally true. If I say things that are true and figure out what is true as often as possible and share that with other people and they do the same to me, together we can move forward and figure this out. But you have to recognize that's not what's going on all the time when people's heads. And in fact, if there's a discussion where people are operating on level, say level three, right, which is very common, especially in, politi in politics, right, most political statements are level three statements, not level one statements. When somebody says, you know, this issue is very concerning, or, you know, isn't it horrible that this thing is happening, without picking out a specific example, just so I don't have to pick a particular side, but like, they are making statements to signal their loyalty to their faction especially on this issue, but also in general, they're trying to identify in a group. And so if they notice that the statement their side is making isn't strictly true, they are not particularly inclined to point this out. They are not particularly have the incentive to point this out. And so maybe even these statements work in some ways better, right? This is something that a lot of authoritarians have figured out when they are in fact false and obviously false, right? If you can convince everybody to make a statement in support of your guy, that everybody knows is not true and say this guy has, has, has blue hair when in fact he has red hair or whatever, then, well, you can get them to say anything. And you've gotten them all to create common knowledge that they can together say anything and do anything. And now you're off to the races. This is a much stronger indicator of group identity. If you're willing to, if you're willing to say something false, right? You're kind of like paying a cost for that membership in a way. Right. And what the simulacra levels do is they let you able to understand what level somebody is operating on. Now you can interpret their statements as their statements were created. And now you understand the situation and you can analyze it. And so no matter what level you're trying to be on, it's helpful to know what level other people are on and what their statements actually mean, right? And so during the pandemic, like you would ask a question like Dr. Fauci, what level is he operating on, right? Is he trying to tell us true information and hope that we will use true information well, and maybe selecting the true information that will be most helpful to us? Is he telling us the information that he thinks will cause us to make the best decisions? Right? Is he on level two? Is he trying to indicate that he is with the science faction, that he is you know, part of the group of people who are responsible? Is he on level three? Or is he doing something like less logical and more vibey on level four? Right? And I think that different people react to him as if he is doing all four of these things during the pandemic. And I reached the conclusion he was on level two. And this very much colored my interpretation of his statements, right? Like you have to understand when he is telling you about the vaccine, he is telling you whatever he thinks will cause you to decide to get vaccinated because he thinks that you getting vaccinated is good. Yeah, I interpreted him on that level too. I, I see what you mean. And I also think that he really pissed off some people that kind of assumed that he would or should be on level one, like, or people who think that scientists should be, you know, when they're publicly speaking about science, should be talking at level one of just like telling us the literal facts. And then it comes out that no, they're telling you what they think will lead you to do the thing that they think is good for you. And that's like, makes some people really, really angry. I mean, he's burning down a kind of joint social capital and faith in science that's been built up over the years, because scientists have a reputation that they're on level one, right? Then when he says masks don't work early in the pandemic, he means masks don't work, as opposed to meaning I would rather you not wear a mask right now because we don't have enough masks, right? And once you know 
that Fauci is deliberately lying to you in many ways, that he is representing things, he is saying that which is not, in order to convince you to do the thing that he genuinely believes would be better for you and your health and the society. Now, can you trust anything else he says, right? You can't, really. What you can trust is you can interpret his statement as a declaration of what he thinks people should do. And if you understand it on that level, then you can legitimately say, okay, he thinks that the science says that we'd be better off if everybody did this. Because I genuinely believe that he actually prefers people to be healthy, not sick. He prefers people to be alive and not dead. He prefers people to be happy and not sad. Like, I don't think he's a bad guy. But you have to understand where he's coming from. And if you instead thought he was operating on level three, then you would interpret his statements at a completely other distinct level, right? And you could almost throw them out the window in terms of choosing your own actions. Right. And you could see each of these different levels operating on something like social media, right? Like, you know, the level one people are just trying to, like, have a discussion about what's true. And the level two people are trying to, like, achieve good outcomes sort of as activists, right? Like pushing an idea that they think is going to help people. And then you have level three people that are just, like, saying their tribal thing to show that they're, like, a good member of their tribe and fighting the other tribes. And then you have level four people that are just, <laughs> like, I don't know, saying things that, like, I don't know, get a lot of likes or something like that. And sort of, like, not, you know, sort of maybe just not tracking that closely of, like, what is the content of what they're actually expressing? Does that seem right? Right. And then you, you'll navigate this mix of people much better if you are able to identify, oh, this person is making a level one argument and this person is responding with a level three objection. Because now you understand what's going on. You can decide whether or not there's a useful thing that would actually accomplish something, right? Because if that happens, then arguing the factual point in response is not a very useful reaction. Whereas if this person was genuinely trying to figure out what was going on, then you should respond in kind. Yeah, it seems like a really useful framework. And yeah, I hope that, uh, hope that people find that it's a way to help them like understand how people are communicating and, and also discuss how people are communicating, right? Because once you have this kind of idea of these different levels, then you can talk about this a lot more clearly. Yeah, and, and also the idea that we have a lot of people, including a lot of our most successful and powerful people in our society, who are primarily operating on level four and who are, in fact, in an important sense, incapable of planning, incapable of thinking terribly logically, of forming multi-step operations, and who are operating on this kind of vibey, floaty, word associational path and that you have to understand them on that level or you won't understand how decisions are getting made. And in general, that our society has over time been ratcheting up the level at which most communication has been happening, where there was a time when you were dealing with mostly ones and twos, and now we're dealing with a hell of a lot of threes and much more fours than we used to be. Like the idea of, you know, living in a post-truth world, that's a level four concept. What level do you think Elon Musk typically operates at when he's like posting on social media? I think Musk is one of those chameleons who is capable of doing all of it and shifts between all four levels depending on his purposes, but that he is not sufficiently skilled to be able to operate on all four at once. He is not like a Buddha or a Jesus or other like great people throughout history. Instead, what's going on is occasionally he'll post something because he thinks it's true or, you know, he thinks it's funny, which is a form of truth in some sense. Sometimes he'll post something because he's trying, sometimes he'll just lie to us, right? He'll say something about Twitter slash X because he thinks this will help the platform when we all know he's full of it, but he's trying to make us believe a model in our heads, right? He's trying to book. Sometimes he's just trying to build up hype. He's trying to like do some sort of vibey thing because he actually knows how to do that. Sometimes he's playing factions, but what he'll often do is he'll make, he'll do something that's like good on one level, but really bad on another level and then ends up pissing off everybody over time because he keeps shifting between them and nobody can keep track. That's an interesting analysis. So what are immoral mazes and how does that connect to sim simulacre levels? So the concept of moral mazes is when you are in an organization with multiple levels of management or you're effectively in a situation where there are many effective levels of authority. Originally, it, the, the term came from corporations, but it can also apply to governments and it can even apply to places where it's not strictly an organization, but it is like a group of people that effectively have a series of authorities. For example, you know, the investors who invest in a progressive series of rounds can be thought of as 
a series of management layers in some abstract sense, if you're looking at it from that way. And the idea being that you lose contact with the fundamental object level of reality when you are neither the CEO at the top making the decision or a person what's called on the line, right? A person who is like working the machines, talking to the customers, building the things, who has to worry about the operations. You're in a world where everything is abstract. Success is largely determined by politics and coalitions and getting along and what it looks like and what people are going to represent about things. And in these situations, what happens is the people who are devoted to success and who are devoted to the success of the people who show themselves to be devoted to success and to have this particular mindset where the thing that matters is climbing the corporate ladder or the equivalent of the corporate ladder in whatever other you know, situation, the accumulation of the relevant form of social status and authority. That this is what matters and you should reward the people who understand this is what matters and prioritize it over everything else in a group and punish the people who do not express this. And this creates a situation in which any other priorities become suspect and they get squeezed out. And if you detect them, you get punished for them. And in which then young people, people who are coming up, who are introduced into the system, get strongly advised to adapt this persona, this level of philosophy, this approach to the situation where they actually self-modify. They change what they care about internally because not only will this cause them to make the right actions and care about the things that will cause them to get rewarded, but people are actually checking their decision processes and their type of person they are and evaluating them on that basis. You want to ally with and work with and advantage the people who will also like make the proper decisions in this sense back to you when the time comes. And so essentially any organization that is sufficiently large with sufficiently many steps will over time become increasingly dominated by the group of people who are devoted to the success of the people in the corporation who are devoted to the success of the people in this group. So could you give an example where you've seen this happen? So the, the original examples from the book Moral Mazes that I'm working off of were from major American corporations with often, you know, 10, 20 plus levels of hierarchy within them during the, I think, the 70s and 80s period. And he would do interviews. And so if you read the book, Marl Mazes, you will hear firsthand accounts from various middle managers just talking in this mindset, talking about these dynamics and these situations from their perspectives. And what I'm describing is my interpretation of what is going on there. And then the core effect, in many ways, I distilled into this concept I call motive ambiguity. The idea behind motive ambiguity is... You want to make it clear that you are not going to let other considerations enter into your decision process because you are trying to show how much you value something else. So I have a post about this where I give a number of examples, the first of which is you are taking your girl, friend or boyfriend or other significant other to a restaurant for your anniversary, and you could choose one that you both like or one that only they like. You choose the one that they like. Because then they know that you are thinking of them and that you are making a sacrifice so that they can be happy. Whereas if you went to the one that you both like, maybe you just wanted to go to the restaurant you liked. Interesting. So can you tie that back to moral mazes in a corporation setting or an organizational setting? Right. So in a similar setting, suppose you have the decision of you have this factory and if you build it the wrong way, it will poison the river. But if you build it the right way, it won't poison the river. But the corporation probably could get away with this in some sense, right? And if you bring up pretty loudly, oh, we need to not poison this river, then everyone has to worry that you're the type of person who cares about whether rivers get poisoned and you might care about other things and you might object if at some point we want to do something that's kind of shady just for our benefit. And maybe you're not going to be a very loyal ally. Maybe you're not going to be a very good confidant. Maybe you have other priorities. And so they look askance at you and they downgrade you in their minds and they're not comfortable with this. And so even if there is no cost to not poisoning this river, you might choose to poison this river anyway. Because essentially, I think what you're saying is that by expressing caring about anything other than the sort of benefit of the people around you, you're signaling against kind of allegiance to them. Is that right? 
Right. You want to show that your loyalties are undivided. This is the thing that you care about. And this then means that you turn actively against morality, right? Not just against outside, like having other interests, but if you care about what the right thing is, then you're a liability. So everyone decides to signal this by caring about doing the wrong thing in some important senses, because that's not, you don't really care about doing the wrong thing. That's not something people actually care about, right? So why is this an important idea? Like, what can we understand better about the world by like applying this idea of a moral maze? So the core insight is if you enter into or build or there exists an organization with many levels of management in it, certainly with more than three or four, and definitely with like six, seven, eight, 10, 15, then by default, people who operate in these ways will take over. They will navigate these situations such that they get promoted, they get into positions of authority, they will help each other. And once they submit themselves in control, it is nearly impossible to get rid of them. So every large organization will eventually become calcified and broken in this way and will in fact destroy the minds of those who enter it and then will operate in these terribly perverse ways. And there seems to be no way to head this off indefinitely. There are founder effects if the CEO and the people at the top are being very, very careful about this. You can hope to slow it down and head it off for some period of time, but eventually they get replaced. And you can mostly only prevent things from getting worse rather than make them better. And historically speaking, the way this plays out is the corporations and governments and organizations that fall prey to this stop producing things, right? They stop being competitive. They start devoting more and more resources to these internal fights and games and signals, and they can't innovate and they can't adjust, and they become more and more wasteful, and they get outcompeted. Someone starts a new company that does the thing better. The neighboring country invades your country, or there's a revolution, and things start again. But now we've entered an age when things are often becoming calcified, where you know big organizations and governments become too big to fail, and that becomes a very, very expensive and nasty proposition, and we're not letting it happen. So is the idea that, well, you know, things failing is obviously not good for the people who are failing, that allowing things to fail at least as a kind of resetting action where when a, when a sort of organization gets too detached from doing the thing itself, it becomes too much about these sort of the self-perpetuating, you know, middle management, helping middle management, that at least failure kind of like reboots it. Exactly. That failure reboots the system when it's no longer working for this or for any other reason. And also the threat of failure keeps you sharp, right? If you are not worried about being replaced, if the system is not sufficiently efficient, then the people who don't particularly care about efficiency, but do care about their own local success will continuously defect against the efficiency of the system and they'll keep winning, right? And that's in fact, what allows you to keep them in line is the, the worry by everybody that if you let this thing get out of hand, then it's bad for all of us. And if that stops working, the whole thing stops working. And the only solutions that I have found to this so far in my exploration of a book length talking about the topic were to either periodically replace the failing organizations with new ones or keep yourself sufficiently small that everybody is grounded on an object level in some sense, right? If you only have two layers of people or at most three, now you're pretty much okay. Because like at least everybody you talk to is relating to things that keep them grounded and concrete and are not lost in, in these endless layers of abstraction. So in what way has society shifted so that these sort of institutions that become detached from reality aren't able to die? Are we talking here at the company level? Are we talking here at the country level? For the, on the country level, you know, countries used to exist in large part in order to protect themselves physically, to fight wars, to ensure that they didn't lose competitions for power with those around them, and to be able to protect themselves against internal risings, but it's become much harder to disrupt these things. It's become seen as more expensive and unthinkable to disrupt these things, and it's happening less and less often. And for corporations and businesses and so on, we're also seeing much less turnover than we used to. And a lot of that is because these businesses have been able to engage in regulatory capture. They've been able to engage in setting up various positions of rent in relation with the government. and. There is, in fact, a maze-like culture 
that has taken over. Some people you know, call them some form of this is you know, the military industrial complex is related to this concept in many ways. So the idea is that when all of the people in all of these big organizations are in fact looking to cooperate with the people who think the same way in these other organizations to try and protect the existing calcified organizations and their people against the outsiders, and this is the primary way in which a lot of systems in our society now operate, it becomes very, very difficult to disrupt. Do people of different genders actually have different personalities? We've all heard that men are from Mars and women are from Venus, but we've also heard that men and women are actually no different from each other at their core. Clearly, both of these perspectives can't be right. Is one of them accurate, or are they both just sensationalized nonsense? To try to answer these questions, the team at clearerthinking.org analyzed enormous amounts of data, ran 15 separate studies, and have now published their results in the form of a free, data-driven test called the Gender Continuum Test. You can take this fun test to learn about the relationship between gender and personality based on data from more than 15,000 people. And you'll probably learn some things about yourself in the process too, since it'll provide a personalized analysis of your personality. To take the Gender Continuum Test or to find Clearer Thinking's other free tools and mini courses, visit clearerthinking.org. So for the final topic before we wrap up, let's talk about the relative difficulty of generation versus evaluation. So can you explain that idea to us and why you think that's really important? So this idea comes up in the context of artificial intelligence and the idea of being able to align, train, like fine tune a system to do what you want to do, to imbue it with the skills you want to have and the morality you want to have and the decisions you want to make. And so right now, what most systems are doing is something that's called RLHF, Reinforcement Learning from Human Feedback. So the idea is that you have the, idea, you have the AI produce outputs, you put them in front of people, and you say, which of, these, which of these outputs do you prefer? And the humans teach it, oh, don't be racist. Oh, say something that actually answers the question you were being asked. Don't drag on too long saying random things. Don't make mistakes. Don't hallucinate, et cetera, et cetera. And it slowly learns what human preferences are to answer something that ideally is more and more helpful. And it is widely recognized that this doesn't really work over long periods of time as we get more powerful systems because it doesn't scale. You need a human to physically be able to answer each of these questions. So it's costly to get each piece of feedback. And also these pieces of feedback are limited to human scale. So if you start training systems that are much smarter than us, that are much more capable than us, then we won't be able to properly evaluate their outputs. So instead, we need to turn to doing automated feedback. And so the idea is, you know, the first version of this is called constitutional AI, which is something Anthropic is working on. So the idea is that the AI will use a written set of guidelines to evaluate its own outputs, or a different AI will evaluate the AI's outputs, and we'll use that to provide feedback so that the AI can train. And in general, it's this concept of, I produce outputs, you produce feedback on those outputs. You tell me whether this output was good or bad, whether I should train to produce more like this or more unlike this. And then the model weights are adjusted such that it understands that information you're giving it. And then you train it to optimize for the best possible feedback. And one of the top ideas in alignment is, well, evaluation is easier than generation, meaning it's easier for me to produce the output, to, to create the response than it is for me to figure out if the response is good. So, you know, in, in many contexts, this is in fact true. So I can decide if you produce good food or you built me a good table, or if this airplane was able to fly from one area to another area, right? Or this car falls over, but I'm unable to actually accomplish these things on that level at all, right? It's much easier often to evaluate if somebody is good at their job than to be able to do that job themselves from a certain point of view or a task or an answer. But this isn't always true. And so you have a mode of thinking that started with Paul Cristiano, I believe, and now has been championed by, among other people, Jan Lakey, who is the head of alignment and the super alignment effort at OpenAI. And they are counting on fundamentally this idea that if the AI produces an output, then it is easier to tell if that output is good than it was to generate the output. Because if that's true, 
then you can use a less powerful, less capable, less smart system and have it figure out if the output was good or bad or which of these two outputs is better. And then you can train the more powerful system iteratively on a slightly less powerful system. And then if you do this enough times, you can get an arbitrarily powerful system to reflect what you want. And that is potentially its entire solution to what we call the alignment problem. And then we can train arbitrarily smart things and not worry that they're going to do something that's subtly not what we wanted or they're going to turn on us or do something else horrible. So to summarize that a little bit, so the idea is that if you can't actually have humans evaluating the output because the output is, let's say, too difficult to evaluate or requires too much skill or knowledge or intelligence, or it's just too costly to get enough training data, what you can do is you can have a... a somewhat less powerful AI system evaluate the output, looking at a set of rules about how it should evaluate it as part of its prompt, and then use that instead. And then as you use that to make your system better, then now you can use that better system to then evaluate and give feedback, and then you can use that to make it even better and so on. And maybe this creates kind of like a bootstrap effect. Is that the idea? Right, if, if GPT-4 can evaluate the outputs of GPT-5, which can then output the evaluations of GPT-6, the what outputs of GPT-6 and so on, then, we can evaluate properly through iteration the outputs of GPT-N for arbitrarily large N, which can be arbitrarily smart and arbitrarily capable, and then use that to cure all disease and spread us throughout the stars and create unlimited fusion power and all the other cool things. That we cool. So how does this relate to sort of the difficulty of aligning these systems? So when you are giving the AI feedback, the AI is not going to differentiate between the mistakes that you make, between the preferences that you have inherently and that you want it to exhibit versus the things that you respond well to, even though if you actually understood what was going on, you wouldn't actually like that so much. It only knows what gets it good feedback and what gets it bad feedback. So for example, if it fools you, Right? It tells you something and, it, and you think, oh, that's amazing. That's super cool. I didn't know that. But it turns out it's just wrong. It just hallucinated the whole thing. It will learn, oh, this is the thing that fools humans into giving me good marks. But it also won't ever learn that it did that by saying something untrue. It'll just know that it got good marks. So there isn't necessarily a concept inherently fooling the human here, depending on how it models this internally, right? How is it representing things? Have all sorts of alien right, concepts. but it but you could also see it learning a rule like, oh, I if I'm going to say something that's false, I need to make sure it's false in a way the human doesn't realize in order to get good credit. Absolutely, and so in general, right, like if you are training the AI to predict the next word, which is with the first step of training, then you're not getting it to do exactly what you want, but it's not going to create an adversarial training effect as such. It's just going to produce whatever it thinks is the most likely next word. If you're trying to train it to give you something you will rate highly, you have to worry that you are training it to do whatever hacks your evaluation system the best, right? That you're hoping that the way to get a good evaluation is to actually be helpful, to actually provide true and useful information, to actually follow all of our preferences. But if there are ways in which that is not true, it will find them and it will absolutely take advantage of them. It seems like this could even be more compounded if you're using earlier models to train the later models. Because if you had sort of a tendency in one of the earlier models to sort of say pleasing things that are untrue, then you use that model to create the labeled training data for the next model. Isn't it just going to propagate it forward into the next model? Yeah, if, absolutely. The, the errors that you make compound every time you move up. So if you, if you have this gap, then you're only going to make things worse, right? You're you're not going to get de novo additional alignment and you're not going to correct your mistakes unless you have a new clever way to do that that isn't in the plan description that I've seen. And thus, things just get farther and farther away from what you actually wanted. And so, in general, my view is essentially that in order to be a useful evaluator at this level, when you've got very, very smart things, you have to be very, very precise and accurate and just not make systematic mistakes. Because if you make any systematic mistakes, it will figure out what they are and it will exploit them and it will learn things you do not want it to learn. And you are effectively, you know, you're facing optimization pressure. You're facing an effectively an adversary. You could even imagine the more advanced models learning to exploit weaknesses in the earlier models, right? So like, let's suppose that the earlier models have a weird thing where if you say a certain kind of thing, they're really happy about it. 
that makes no sense. The later model is just going to learn to say those weird things, like that, those weird edge cases that <laughs> the, the, the earlier models think are really good for nonsensical reasons because they're, you know, slightly just not what we intended to train them on. Absolutely. And so it boils down to the question of, can I evaluate well enough the outputs you are generating such that you can't do anything adversarial with those outputs and you are not going to figure out unintended ways, weird things that you should be doing that I wouldn't intend as part of the system because otherwise things will entirely break down over time as you attempt to ratchet up step by step by step. And this is relying on the idea that at whatever skill level I require to generate the outputs, that I can use a lower skill level than that to form a sufficiently accurate evaluation of what I'm looking at. And that requires that second task to be easier, not harder than the first task. I do not think this is in general true. And I do not think it is specifically true here. Yeah, it seems like it's what you're describing sets a almost impossibly high bar, right? Like that in our process of labeling the data, whether having humans do it or earlier AI models, that there aren't these sort of exploitable edge cases. But like, how would we ever know that there aren't exploitable edge cases? Well, we never know that there are no exploitable edge cases. So like one response you can make is, well, we're not going to train enough different data points for these narrow, weird edge cases to get recognized and fully exploited. Or that, well, well maybe there'll be some distortions, but they will be limited in scope and it will mostly be fine. But I don't put a lot of faith in these approaches in these situations. I think that as we get more capable systems, they will be much, much better at very quickly narrowing in on these types of exploitable mistakes, or rather they'll just have more optimization pressure. They will faster figure out what will actually give you a good response. And there's no way to differentiate between the response you meant to make and the response that you actually do make. There's only whatever the evaluation function is that you're actually using for better and for worse. And it will learn what that is. And I see this as a very, very serious problem. When I look at like other practical tasks in the world that I go through, right? Sometimes evaluation is easier than generation. I think it's much easier to evaluate whether or not a table is a good table than it is to build a table. But at other times, you know, it's much easier to write a program that halts than to know if a program halts, for example, right? In a in a very strict one. And it is much, much easier to say the kind of things that like my nine-year-old says than it is to know the proper response to that child that will teach them the lessons they need to take away from this interaction such that they will be able to properly improve and understand what I care about and what's true about the world and what's important. So if we think about this idea that some problems are, it's easier to generate the thing and harder to evaluate it and some things reversed. Like, what do we what do we take from that idea, right? Like, what is it? So, the, so whether a situation is harder to evaluate or harder to generate, like, so what are the what are the conclusions from that? Well, so if you're doing, if you're trying to do the thing, if you're trying to like get good at the thing or make the thing happen, then you have to ask, like, what is my hard problem? What do I need to figure out? So, for example, last night I was talking to uh, uh, someone whose name is Olkar, who's a friend of mine. And she is trying to figure out if there are latent scientific discoveries that AIs could discover and then bring to the world. Because the idea being that like often 30 years later, someone will be like, oh, there are these two papers that were written 30 years ago. And if you combine these two ideas, suddenly you have this highly useful thing that nobody's ever realized because they're just coming from different people in different places. But an AI could be very, very good at just like checking all the pairs to see if something comes up or like reading all the abstracts and seeing if something comes out of that. And what's going to happen is the AIs could come up with a lot of different ideas here. And then the question is, you know, what's the easy step? Is it generating hypotheses for things that are interesting? Or is it evaluating which of these hypotheses are true? And depends on the detailed context. But like, for example, in drug discovery, right, is it easier to come up with compounds that might be helpful, candidate drugs? Or is it easier to evaluate which of those candidate drugs work? Right? right now, the limiting factor very much seems to be actually trying the candidates and finding out which ones work. That's really hard and expensive and slow. So does this suggest that the main problem in AI safety is like figuring out how to do better evaluations? I would say whether or not you can do evaluations 
that are sufficiently high quality without having a similarly or perhaps even greater capable system in context is going to determine whether or not you can use a wide range of strategies. And we don't really have other strategies right now that seem that promising. So it seems like a really important problem to be able to do. Yeah, if we can afford to evaluate AI outputs using less capable or at worst similarly capable systems, and this is sufficiently good feedback that it converges on something that is indeed aligned to what we want, we can stop working. But it makes the problem that we now live in a world where alignment is what some people call easy, right? It's a tractable, solvable problem. We just have to do the work. And you know, it's clear that our current methods for doing this will not scale properly. Like he said this very, very explicitly uh, in the 80,000 Hours podcast, for example. But it is very possible then that like something like iterated distilled amplification done in a careful, well thought out manner would in fact just work and we just have to build it and iterate and run the experiments and figure out how it goes. However, if that doesn't work, then we don't know what to do, right? We're, we're just unmoored. One thing I've been thinking about lately is systems like Bitcoin and their relationship to building really safe, secure AI systems. Because something interesting about Bitcoin, there's this protocol, you could, anyone can read the code of it. And if there was a bug in it, you could potentially make a huge amount of money, right? And we've seen this actually with other crypto projects where someone finds a bug in a protocol and like takes $50 million or $500 million, right? And so it's like, why do we believe that Bitcoin is secure? It's because there's so much money lying. There's been years of people poking at it and there's so much money lying, you know, lying around for someone who could potentially exploit it that we can kind of assume that it's unexploitable. And I wondered if something like that could be leveraged for AI safety, where imagine you had a system where you could just, anyone in the world could kind of poke at it and there was money on the line where if you found a way that you could like exploit it, you could actually make money from doing that. And as time went by and like the exploits kind of get patched over and over again, you eventually get to the point where like years go by and nobody seems to be able to find any more exploits, even though they can make increasingly large sums of money, you kind of get increasingly high confidence. So I'm, I'm curious, do you think there's something like that that could be applicable for AI safety? So there is for current systems very much so, where, you know, GPT-4 comes out and then everyone in the world goes, hey, let's see if we can make it say the, the nasty thing that it's not supposed to say. And we all red team it, right? We all try different things. We try to jailbreak it. We try to manipulate it. We try to twist it around in various ways. And then every time we do, OpenAI is alerted to this and they say, oh, I'd better plug that hole. And they figure out what's wrong and they fix it and they iterate. And now it's pretty hard to get GPT-4 to say the things we don't want to say. It's still possible. And then over time, if we just kept the system static, it would get better and better at this. The problem being, if we did this with an actually dangerous system, right, we would be dead before we had finished plugging all of the holes. It's not that simple. We can't just red team a highly dangerous system in this way. So like, sure, you can plug up the exploits of like one particular version of the AI, but then the concern is that as you go to the next version, you could just end up in a really dangerous situation before you've plugged the exploits. Right, what we're, what we're hoping in some sense is that these exploits will, gen will be generalized and will be totalizing, right? Like that we can fully describe all of the ways in which GPT-4 goes wrong, and in doing so, we fully describe all the ways in which GPT-5 and GPT-6 will go wrong, and so on, until the actually dangerous systems. And I just don't think that's how the world of physics is going to be kind to us in that way. I think that we're going to find new security problems as the systems gain new capabilities, and new intelligence, and new size. And what we red teamed on the previous system will not be sufficient. Those solutions that we had will stop working because the systems will effectively find ways to plot around them. Then you know, they will be working in different ways and presenting us with different threats. And so Rob Miles described the problem as having a safe LLM is like having a safe operating system, right? That's what it means to build something safe. And then Paul Graham noticed, but the only way we know of to have a safe operating system is to start with an unsafe operating system and release it. Yeah, and then wait like 10 years, right? And then if it gets updated too much, it's no longer safe. It's going to have bugs again, right? Exactly. Every time you're updating it, 
or there's just new things it's interacting with potentially. You're introducing new bugs into the code. You're introducing new problems that you have to deal with. But over time, you can be confident that your operating system is more and more safe, is harder and harder to exploit, and has less and less dangerous problems with it. And then eventually it becomes safe, and then maybe you can iterate it on it relatively safely. But you only do this by creating a series of opportunities for exploitation to get humans to exploit it. And we're also counting on the things that are trying to exploit this operating system or this code only being human. If in the future, the thing that's trying to exploit the thing is in fact far more capable than the humans, then the humans hunting for opportunities are not going to find things that a smarter thing, a more capable thing, a thing that can iterate over more things and search more of the space and have more things in its memory and cross compare more combinations will be able to find. So you're not going to be able to anticipate all of the problems you are going to face the way we might be able to now. And indeed, bugs in code are one of the examples, I think, of places where evaluation is much harder than generation. I can write code that does the thing most of the time that I want to do far easier than I can write actually bug-free code, or then I can evaluate the code of somebody else that does the thing I want mostly or most of the time and find all of the bugs in that code, especially if I don't know how many bugs there are or whether there's any bugs at all. This conversation makes me wonder whether, as we build these models to be bigger and bigger, there's a way of doing it much more slowly. So if we look at the way OpenAI did it, they went from version 2 to GB3, then 3.5, then 4. I, okay, maybe they had internal models that were like in between those. But imagine that you could release like GPD 4.0001 and then GPD 4.0002. And like each model is just sort of like slowly learning on top of what it was learned before rather than these sort of like large discrete jumps. I don't know that that would help anything, but I wonder if an approach like that could make it so that it's much less likely that it sort of suddenly, it being able to be safe at one level will then kind of more smoothly transition to being safe at higher levels rather than sort of you release the next model and now it suddenly has all these new exploits that you'd never seen before. I think the smaller the jumps that we make, the safer we are. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Like one of the reasons is just if GPT-7 is the version that's capable of actually killing us or that leads to this horrible problem, then GPT-6.97 that isn't quite capable of fully pulling this off is probably going to create some sort of lesser disaster or attempt to create the problem or show a lot of signs of creating this problem. And then maybe we'll be able to realize, oh, now we have a problem. We should stop here and not go to GPT-7 until we've done a bunch more work. And also, yeah, we have the ability to use 697 to then like do all of our research, try all of our things, see what's about to happen, see what might be happening, accelerate all of our other work, including our alignment and safety work. So yeah, the slower we go, the better off we are including the more incremental steps we make, the better off we are. Like I'd rather, you know, go 4, 4.1, 4.2, 4.3 every month than just jump to five in 10 months, even if it meant that like at any given moment we had a more powerful AI than we would have otherwise had. Right, because even if 6.97 is not enough to kill all humanity and seven is, 6.97 might be able to kind of give you much more of the idea of the exploits available than version six was. Yeah, it's probably going to scale their hell out of us in some way. It's probably going to get misused in some way. Like, one of the things I think about is if you have a base model, right, that base model might just be inherently dangerous if it's sufficiently capable, just that you just give it the wrong instruction or you unleash it in the wrong situation or on the wrong problem and hell, all hell breaks loose in some sense. But you also might have a problem where, okay, if you were to use it responsibly, right? And this is the question of like the types of systems, right? If you use this thing responsibly, it would be fine. But if someone was intentionally trying to use it irresponsibly or somebody who hooked it up to the wrong type of scaffolding, made it agentized like more explicitly, did various forms of work to try and make it more dangerous or put it in a situation where it was given an open-ended goal and various gloves were taken off or various additional capabilities and affordances were given to it, et cetera, et cetera now it becomes far more dangerous. Then there's this danger that we release something out of the wild or we just make it available for use and we train it and we fine tune it. And it contains like the seed of power that like can then reasonably cheaply be amplified with the right techniques. 
but we don't necessarily have those techniques yet. But then two years later, those techniques get developed and now we're all in trouble. And the more we make incremental steps, the more we do have to worry about that sort of thing, but also the more warning we might have of if we develop, you know, four, seven and four, seven is safe when used responsibly, but we can figure out a way to use it irresponsibly if we really wanted to, right? If some malicious actor was intentionally trying to make the thing go haywire, he could do a hell of a lot of damage. Well, now we can know that, maybe even release 4.7 with the proper safeguards, right? If we just keep the, we keep the model weight secured in the vaults and we check the inputs and we don't allow anyone to call it too many times in a row and various other things, maybe it's like the misuse problem is not so bad, but now we know we absolutely cannot go to 4.8 until we've done a lot more homework. I do want to emphasize that these problems of alignment and exactly how to go about deploying systems, these difficulties are incredibly hard. Most people, even who work on these problems, I think, do not recognize anything like the degree to which they are hard and the degree to which we need to figure out a lot of the solutions to a lot of impossible problems in order to get through this. But that also creates a situation in which it is very hard often to know which approach to certain questions like this will work better because they all make some set of impossible problems easier and some other set of impossible problems harder. Where's the best place for people to find your work? You definitely find me on Substack. So vitzv.substack.com. You can also find my, my work on WordPress with the same name and on Less Wrong. And I'm on Twitter as Vitzv. Vitzv, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, it was a very fun conversation. Thank you for having me. Thanks again for listening. We always love to hear from our listeners. So if you have questions or comments for us, just send us an email at clearerthinkingpodcast at gmail.com. This episode was edited by Ryan Kessler and transcribed by We Amplify. Miles Kestrin handles marketing for the podcast and Uri Bram is the podcast's factotum. If you like our show, then we'd really appreciate it if you could rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about us on social media. We also hope you'll subscribe to our email newsletter called One Helpful Idea. Each week, we'll send you one idea that we think is really valuable that you can read about in just 30 seconds, along with that week's new podcast episodes, an essay by Spencer, and announcements about upcoming events. To sign up for that newsletter or to find show notes, transcripts, and more info about the show, visit podcast.clearerthinking.org. A listener asks, what do you like most and least about yourself? Hmm, good question. So some things I like most about myself. I like that I essentially always have positive intent. And in, in other words, I never want anyone to come to harm. Even people I think are harmful people, I don't want them to come to harm. I want everyone to thrive and I want everyone to be happy. Of course, sometimes you have to protect people from other people. Some people are going to cause harm and they may need to be locked up in jail and things like that. But I want uh, I don't want anyone to come to harm. And I, and I like that about myself. Another thing I like about myself is that I really love exploring ideas and I really love learning new things and figuring out better ways to think about something. So if I have one way to think about it and someone points out a better way to think about it, I like about myself that that's exciting to me and I tend to want to adopt this better way of thinking about it. Things I don't like about myself, one is that I worry more than I would want myself to worry and I don't think it's useful the amount of wor I worry. And that's something I've worked on for a long time. It's, it's definitely improved over the years, but I, I still worry more than I would want to. Another thing I don't like about myself is I feel tired more often than I would want to feel tired. I, I've always felt tired since I was a child, and uh, I find it frustrating and annoying, and I've spent a lot of time trying to improve that. But I think still I, I tend to feel tired quite often.